So last month, I was perusing Instagram, as you do, when I came across to this Emily Weiss post. Emily was praising Angela Ahrens, who was the woman in the photo, unbeknownst to me at the time, as being the former Burberry CEO and the highest paid employee at Apple. This woman had clearly accomplished so much, yet I did not know who she was. I went into a deep dive of Googling, YouTubing, podcasting, anything -ing, and putting together all the information I could on Angela's life. To your, your life, your career, where you come from. Uh, just, just tell us a little bit about that. So Angela grew up in a family of six in New Palestine, Indiana, and her graduating class was 150 people. This place looks like somewhere you would see a tumbleweed roll through. She loved to paint, she loved to draw. She went to Ball State University, which is a university in Indiana, very Midwestern, and she wanted to be a designer. Her dream was to go to New York. One of her design classes, her teacher noticed that she had a better eye than talent, and so the teacher pulled her aside and said, I actually think you're what we call a merchant. Day after her graduation, hopped on a plane, no job, showed up in New York City knocking on doors. But I think, again, I think you have instincts and I would use your instincts. She had a distant connection. A gentleman who her parents played golf with had a connection to someone in a menswear company in New York. She wasn't really interested in menswear and the position that they had was a sales position. Even though it wasn't what she wanted, it was a foot in the door. And so she took the job. She was grateful for the job. Because I don't think you work for companies. I think you work for people. She went on to join a handful of other companies. This entire time she's in New York, she's working 80 hours a week. And one day she got a call from a gentleman who was running Donna Karen. Do you feel that it's a part of your job really to just make make it easy for a woman to get dressed so that doesn't I feel it's a part of my job to do it for me and I know if I'm doing it for me then there's somebody else out there who wants it too. And they invited her to join as vice president she was 27. She credits herself that yes I may have only had eight years experience but I was working 80 hours a week, so I felt like I had 15 years experience. You know, I discovered along the way that I'm a very 50-50 person. I'm half right brain, which is creative, empathy, et cetera, and I'm 50% left brain, which is more analytical and structured and organized, and so I'm this weird, so I need both. So her time at Donna Karen really sharpened her right brain. She traveled the world learning about color and fashion. Clothes that were easy, simple, sophisticated, could travel. Seven years later, she joined another company doing corporate merchandising. I left and went to a corporation called Liz Claiborne where we acquired four to five companies a year and it was a very business role. She said that sharpened her left brain. So had she not had those two very different experiences before joining Burberry and coming on as their CEO, she probably wouldn't have been as prepared as she was. She tells a really incredible story of the worst advice she's ever been given. Very first day, um, they did these videos and then they played it back and I, I liked it. I thought, oh, I, I liked it. I felt the energy, it felt really positive. And, and then they spent the next five hours critiquing every single thing I did. Don't move your hands, Don't, you talk too fast, you know. Blech. She said on the first day there, I'm not gonna participate in this, I'm out of here. So she left. A month later, that's when she got the call to be the CEO of Burberry. So she said, to thyself be true. After 25 years of working in fashion in New York, she joins Burberry in 2006 and moves her three kids, two dogs and one husband to London. While she's there as CEO, the first thing she does is promote Christopher Bailey to creative director at Burberry. And she actually knew Christopher from her time at Donna Karen. So he becomes creative director and together they create an, a whole new strategy for Burberry. And we were looking for white space. We were looking, you know, we had fierce competitors. And then, you know, of course I have every friend in the world sending me all of the analysis of, you know, how many CEOs fail in the first three months, how many CEOs <laughs> fail in the first year. So it was company first. And I always said it was a business, a publicly traded business, and they happened to be in the business of fashion. And so, and that was the lens we took, and, and we were in the people business. Absolutely wanted a retail-led growth strategy. 25% of their business was retail at that point, and we knew that that's what we had, that we knew we were gonna tar target a younger customer because none of, the, um, you know, none of the peers were, the millennials, if you will. Um, we knew everything we did had to be British because that was our differentiator compared to our big Italian and French counterparts, and we just literally sat there, you know, and went line by line. So Burberry at the time, 
was not performing very well. We were making $30 million when I started. It was not, you know. And they really stripped away everything Burberry was doing and went back to what Burberry was founded on, which was their raincoat. Within her first five years as CEO, Burberry doubled its revenues and operating income. What fascinated me about learning about this strategy that they had crafted is in 2015, I vividly remember wanting a Burberry raincoat deeply because I had seen at the time Essie Button and Estee Lalonde now and Viviana Does Makeup, which is now the Anna edit, they were invited to the Burberry fashion show. And I remember watching that and thinking, Oh, that's like the coolest thing ever. From a business perspective and from a marketing perspective, it's so interesting that like little old me in a very small city in Canada, even that reached me. While she was with Burberry in 2012, she was the highest paid CEO in the UK, but she still remained like incredibly philanthropic. And I grew up two miles from the largest orphanage in Indiana and the school bus would pass it every day and, and it would break my heart that those kids were there and. And, and so I think that that's also kind of stuck with me. So you don't forget what you came from and then you, know, you try and pay it forward. With her time at Burberry, she created the Burberry Foundation. And so 1% of Burberry's early revenue goes towards young children in the arts. Because of that, she was named an honorary dame, the dame commander of the British Empire by the queen. I mean, how cool is that? Angela really did when she was with Burberry was she really rethought retail stores and online experience to be really focused in online media. So in a week, more people visit Burberry.com than every Burberry store across the world. She put iPads, like 10,000 iPads across all the Burberry stores so that each employee could speak directly, you know, with a customer, engage with them. When you watch interviews with her, she is so humble. I have been in the fashion industry over 60% of my life, from New York to LA and now London. But I've also been from a small Midwestern town and a really big family, 100% of my life. It was actually really hard to find all this information about her because in her interviews, she always finds a way to redirect the conversation away from her and her accomplishments and back to her team. When you have that mentality that it's not about you, I, I believe strongly in servant leadership. It's, it was never about me. I've never handed out a business card. The nine year mark of her Burberry career, Angela had been pursued for the previous year, for a whole year by Tim Cook. He just looked at me and he said, you know you're supposed to be here. Wow, wow. And I, you know, and I said, how do you know that? And he said, because I watched your TED talk and trust me, you're supposed to be here. And that was, you know, I think with at any, you know, you have a lot of crossroads in your life. And I think that people will say one thing that sticks with you. And that, that actually haunted me. When he said that, that's what made up her mind. And Burberry was a team of 11,000, which she loved. You know, she, she didn't leave Burberry easily. But Apple's retail team is 70,000 people. So how much more could she accomplish on that scale? And I think that's what really brought her over to Apple. Apple actually is the second most profitable company in the world. It's kind of a pinnacle of someone's career. Apple at the time when, when Angela joined and currently still does, they have the most productive retail stores in the world in terms of income per square foot or profit per square foot. On average, US stores earn $2,000 per square foot a day. Apple averages $5,000 per square foot, which is kind of crazy when you think about Apple has only been selling in stores for 10 years. First thing she did as the VP of, of retail was she went on a listening tour across the US to engage in retail employees directly. And she decided to build a platform where all of these retail employees could share their ideas for stores. I think that's what really led to, so during her time there with Apple, their retention rate of retail employees went from 60% to 90. So the decisions she made at Apple were really about reimagining what a, a modern retail store could be. And I see a lot of parallels that I think Emily Weiss drew from her experience with Angela in terms of doing the pop of the Glossier pop-ups and how much thought is put into the experience rather than maximizing direct sales per square foot. Angela talked a lot about wanting these stores to be a fixture in the community. How do we make sure that we create an experience where the best of Apple comes together, one. But two, how do we make sure that, that the bigger that Apple gets, we put something there that's so wow, but also that is so incredibly locally relevant. And 
and, and we said, how do we, um, you mentioned Steve, and, and Tim has followed on. Tim says that education is a pillar for the company. We'll teach kids to code three times a day, free of charge, whenever their parents can bring them in. February of last year, Apple announced Angela would be leaving the company. And they said it was to pursue new and professional pursuits. This was kind of surprising because in January, she was featured in Vogue talking about one of their big brick and mortar locations. It's surprising that the next month there'd be a release of her, of her leaving, but I think as Emily put it, like what a woman. The work that she did with them was remarkable and her entire tenure, you know, as a businesswoman is just so inspirational. She really did focus on giving back to her community. I loved learning about Angela. Like I am a total fangirl. My dream, I hope, I have imagined someday I'm in an airport and I get to talk to her. If you don't want to miss another video in this series, then make sure you hit the subscribe button, click the bell button, and you'll be notified when I release a new video. And I will see you guys next time.